And now I am pleased to introduce the president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, Dr. Holly Humphrey. Hello, everyone. I am really pleased to add my welcome to all of you to um, participate with us today in this webinar. This is the third webinar in our continuing series on bias and discrimination in clinical learning environments. And today we are tackling a particularly challenging topic. Challenging because as health professionals, we are trained to care for all patients, regardless of their beliefs or their circumstances. And so to help us with this challenging topic, I am pleased to welcome Pooja Chandra Shaker, who is halfway through her medical school education at Harvard Medical School, and her mentor, Sachin Jain, who is the president and CEO of the SCAN Group and SCAN Health Plan and an adjunct professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. Let me give you a preview of how we will spend our time together today. I will begin by providing a very brief background of how we got to uh, where we are with this important topic. I will then turn things over to today's guests. And when they are finished with a very brief overview of this complex topic, we are going to turn it over to you and invite you to ask questions of us. And then when we get to the end of this hour, I will provide some wrap up comments. So let's get started. A year ago, right now, um, this very week, the Macy Foundation convened a conference in Atlanta, Georgia to deal with the topic of harmful bias and discrimination in our clinical learning environments. We convened 44 leaders in health professions education, healthcare delivery systems, as well as learners and representatives of various accrediting bodies. To prepare for this conference, we commissioned four papers and three case studies. And in fact, the topic that we're covering today is a topic that was one of the commissioned papers for the conference. As a result of three days of deliberations, the conferees uh, came up with four very broad overarching recommendations. They were consensus recommendations. They were refined by the planning committee and approved by all conferees. And all of the recommendations are accompanied by a series of action steps, which you can read and explore um, at the link that is featured on this slide. It's on our website. It's under the publication section. I don't think you'll have any trouble um, finding it. So when we began that conference, we began um, by crafting a vision, a vision um, for the work we were about to do. And you see that statement right here. Our nation's health professions learning environments from classrooms to clinical sites to virtual spaces should be diverse, equitable, and inclusive of everyone in them, no matter who they are. Every person who works, learns, or receives care in these places should feel that they belong there. And so with that introduction, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Sachin Jain. Thanks so much, Dr. Humphrey. It's really uh, an honor to be here. And I wanna start out by uh, saying a big thank you on behalf of health professionals, students, and healthcare professionals uh, across the nation to the Macy Foundation for taking on this topic, which uh, historically has gone undiscussed uh, and unmanaged across healthcare organizations and institutions across the country. My journey uh, to this topic began through a personal experience, a personal experience 10 years ago when I was a house officer at the Brigham Women's Hospital, and I was called to uh, a patient's bedside to assist them with a medication related issue. And the patient's response to me turned from uh, belligerent and angry to racist. Uh, when the patient, uh, after not getting exactly what he wanted, turned to me and said, why don't you go back to India? At the moment, uh, 
I had a visceral reaction. I was projected back to playground where I experienced many such racist diatribes, but felt immediately unprepared for the interaction because I had never even contemplated the possibility that it might happen. That as a trained healthcare professional in the service of patients, I might find myself the victim of a racist diatribe. And regrettably, I reacted angrily to the patient and told the patient that he should just get out of the hospital uh, and went about the next, the, the next 24 hours through a journey trying to understand what I could have done differently, what the consequences of my actions might be, what the consequences of the patient's actions might be. And I found just 10 years ago that there was essentially no guidance in sight. Neither my attending, nor the nursing manager, nor the institution's uh, professional standards board, nor the patient bill of rights that stood in the hallway actually spoke to this issue of racist patients. And so I decided to do what any uh, third year resident at, 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 in my position might do, which is I wrote about it. Uh, I wrote about it in part for my own catharsis, uh, but I also wrote about it because I wanted to hear what the field had to say about it. And the manuscript that I wrote was rejected from two top tier medical journals as being non-topical or irrelevant. Uh, and the third journal, uh, which was the Annals of Internal Medicine, published it despite the fact that a number of reviewers had recommended it against publishing it because my reaction towards the patient was seen as inappropriate, um, and uh, they didn't necessarily want to give voice to it. My reaction to the patient was certainly not something I'm proud of, but it was also something that I felt like had gone undiscussed in the course of clinical care. And in my subsequent roles as a leader of healthcare organizations, I realized that most institutions treat this like a non-problem. Uh, they treat it like in the way that Dr. Humphrey referenced, which is that the patient is always right, which is what we're always kind of trained to think and trained to believe and how we're trained to operate, that regardless of the patient's views or attitudes or anger, our job is to care and care is what we do. But in the process, we make invisible healthcare workers. We make invisible the feelings of the people who are entrusted and charged with taking care of patients in their most vulnerable moments. And in not having any frameworks through which to view these interactions or behaviors, uh, we find, I think we leave people feeling naked, unsupported, uh, and uh, you know, vulnerable within the environment in which they're supposed to be giving their best to patients every single day. Uh, when my piece was published in the annals, I received a number of different reactions. Uh, I got reactions from uh, a number of clinicians who said that I should have known better than to react angrily to the patient. Um, ignoring the fact that perhaps my own humanity, my own vulnerability was a part of the equation. But I got even more letters from uh, minority physicians across the country who said, thank you for capturing what I face every single day uh, as a minority taking care of patients or as a trainee taking care of patients. And I heard stories, many of them quite disturbing, in which we as a profession were enabling racist behaviors and discriminatory behaviors not just to you know, attending physicians, you know, nurses and nursing assistants, but to vulnerable students. And so I am uh, really pleased that the Macy Foundation has given light to this topic. Um, you know, in some ways it's embarrassing, I think for our profession that we've not talked about it or engaged this topic in the way uh, that we are engaging it now. But I, to that, I would say better late than never. And just again, a, a, a huge uh, uh, kind of statement of gratitude to the Macy Foundation which is so influential in transforming medical education uh, for, for taking this topic on. Um, I'm thrilled to uh, partner with Pooja Chandrasekhar, who's an absolutely brilliant uh, second year medical student at Harvard. Who's been, she's been a longtime mentee of mine. And together, you know, we've worked on, uh, I think, some frameworks that hopefully you'll find helpful and useful uh, on the ethical dilemma of the biased patient. And I'll now turn it over to Pooja, who will share you know, some, of what we, some of the thinking that we developed. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane. And again, I just want to echo the, the statement of gratitude in the Macy Foundation. So, you know, Dr. Jane's experience really embodies the tension 
that clinicians feel in taking care of biased patients. It brings us to this question that how do we reconcile our respect for patient autonomy and this expectation that's often implicit to always put patients first with the basic right of clinicians to also be treated with dignity and respect? Right now, during health professions education and training, we are given very little guidance and instruction on how to answer this question. And moreover, few healthcare organizations have clear policies or procedures to guide staff in responding to these incidents when they do occur. So that really brings us to the central question which we hope to, to delve into during this talk. How should individual clinicians and healthcare organizations as a whole respond when patients exhibit biased or discriminatory behavior? And what kinds of policies and training can mitigate the effects of these experiences? Next slide. So to answer this question, we'll first discuss how the individual clinician res should respond and then how to tackle this issue at the institutional level. So let's start with the first question of how can the individual clinician respond? So up here is a distilled version of our framework for responding to biased patients. So I'll start with the leftmost um, framework here. So we recommend that clinicians begin when confronted with such a situation by first assessing three key characteristics. The first and perhaps the most important and one that should always be a priority is the clinician's own safety and well-being. Do they feel safe in the situation to proceed? The second is the patient's medical condition. Are they in need of emergent medical care? Is their decision-making capacity intact given the particular condition they have? And the third, are the reasons for a patient's behavior or their request to be reassigned to another clinician. So regarding this last one, we wanna emphasize that there are entirely legitimate and reasonable reasons why patients might act a particular way or request a different clinician. And these might include a history of discrimination within the healthcare system or a history of past trauma. So it's really crucial to try and understand why the patient is behaving this way and whether their actions convey an intent, an intent to hurt or shame the target clinician. So next, moving on to the ACT part of the framework. So up the first two listed here, uh, we really see them as immediate responses. If the clinician feels unsafe at any time, they have the right to exit the encounter and transfer care. Or if the patient is unstable, medical care should certainly take priority. Otherwise, we need to determine whether the patient's behavior is ethically just justifiable. And that's not an easy decision to reach, uh, but there are a few questions we can ask here. And if the answer to those questions is yes, then we might be inclined to accommodate or otherwise tolerate the behavior. If the answer is no, then clinicians should absolutely express their discomfort. And then depending on the nuances of the situation at hand, as well as the resources that are available in the care setting that they're working in, they can decide to engage in negotiation or persuasion or decide to transfer care if that's the best way forward. Now, moving on to the last part of the framework, following the incident. We believe that clinicians should inform supervisors and administrators and also report the incident. And depending on how severe the incident is and whether or not it appears to be rooted in bigotry, they should also consider documenting the interaction in the patient's chart. And that should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. There also needs to be opportunities for clinicians to reflect on what happened. And this is really important. Set aside these uh, moments to debrief with the team and turn what is usually a painful, profoundly degrading experience in some ways into an opportunity for professional growth and learning. Next slide. Now at the institutional level, institutions have an ethical obligation to ensure the safety and well-being of clinicians. So up here we've outlined how institutions can best support each of these three groups, patients, clinicians, and the organization as a whole. 
So for patients, you recommend that institutions provide patients with guidelines around conduct. And these guidelines should proactively communicate what the institution's values are and their commitment to diversity. And this info should be made available to all patients prior to or during the time that they request an appointment. For clinicians, we need organizational efforts to educate them. To educate them on one, their rights and responsibilities, not only as caregivers, but also as employees. And second, as how to respond when facing or witnessing discriminatory patient behavior. And this kind of training can include institutional protocols. It could also in include uh, de-escalation techniques. At the organization level, organizations need to develop clear policies, protecting clinicians from patient bias, and as well as a reporting mechanism for violations when they do occur. We also need systems for advocating blame between the patient and the clinician, because there certainly can be situations where clinicians' behavior may provoke patients to behave or react in a certain way. And along with these strategies, we also need pa parallel cultural and research advances. We have to commit to cultivating a culture that normalizes reporting and supports clinicians. Over and over again, we hear that healthcare professionals, especially trainees, express feeling worried about the impact of reporting on their career prospects. And we have to work towards changing the culture if we're gonna begin addressing this problem. And finally, there's a severe lack of systematic research on this topic. And we need further investigation on what are the causes and impacts of biased patient behavior and what are the interventions that have been tested and what are the inter interventions that have worked. Next slide. Now, since many of you are educators, we want to spend a little bit of time highlighting the impact of patient bias on trainees. And of course, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart as a trainee myself. It's well established that trainees are particularly vulnerable to patient bias. That's for a variety of reasons, including our position in the medical hierarchy, our concerns about being perceived as weak or vulnerable, and our fear about repercussions on our grades or evaluations. And this has very real consequences, including a decreased ability to focus on learning and training, this, this feeling of being devalued and invisible, opportunities where, you know, moments where we avoid rotations and clinical sites, uh, where encounters with these patients are, are more common. And perhaps the worst one is coming away with this misconception that this is part of the job and this is just how it is. So how can you, as educators um, and supervisors, address this? First, set expectations. Set expectations out of the gate. Discuss protocols for responding to incidents of patient bias when they do occur. And do this at the start of your relationship with trainees. And make sure you discuss when a trainee might wish to handle a situation independently, because each trainee will have different preferences and come to the table with different experiences. Second, decide whether to intervene. Trainees generally have little decision-making authority to protect themselves. So it's crucial that you as a supervisor step in when needed. And third, debrief. I mentioned this already, but debriefing is so important. Always debrief with the trainee after the incident. Give them the space to talk about their experience in a safe, non-judgmental way. And try to facilitate learning. Help them feel more prepared if they were to confront a similar situation in the future. Try to sit down with them and brainstorm different potential responses to a biased patient. And doing all three of these strategies is a good starting point in addressing this, uh, this issue when it does happen to trainees. Next slide. So we wanted to highlight the Macy Conference recommendations that are most relevant to addressing patient bias. The first is build an institutional culture of fairness, respect, and anti-racism by making diversity, equity, and inclusion top priorities. As part of this culture that we create, we should also commit to seeing discrimination against both patients and clinicians as unacceptable. Next slide. The second recommendation is to develop, assess, and improve systems to mitigate harmful biases and to eliminate racism and all other forms of discrimination. 
As part of these efforts to eliminate discrimination, we need action around this issue. We need institutions and all of you as medical educators to create the systems that not only enable us to acknowledge the harm caused by biased patients, but also address the harm. And we need to stop seeing discrimination against clinicians as the elephant in the room. Next slide. For a more full discussion on this topic and more details about our frameworks that I briefly presented here, uh, we strongly encourage you to take a look at, at our, and read our paper that's published in Academic Medicine. Next slide. And Dr. Jane's paper, The Racist Patient, uh, which he described earlier, is also an excellent deep dive into his experience with the patient he mentioned. And it beautifully lays out the challenges and frustrations that this issue presents, particularly to trainees. Next slide. Finally, another of Dr. Jane's papers is The Pre Prejudiced Patient, uh, which provides an in-depth discussion on the ethical challenges that are associated with caring for biased patients. Next slide. And I'll end our presentation here by reminding you that as with most problems in healthcare, this is one that requires all hands on deck. Addressing patient bias is a complex issue and it's one that needs to be addressed jointly by not only individual clinicians, but also healthcare institutions and health professions educators. With that, I'd like to thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, and again, thank you to the Macy Foundation for giving us the space and platform to talk about this issue. And we're happy to take any questions and engage in a discussion with you all. Thank you. Thank you. And as a reminder to all attendees, we have enabled the chat function um, in your Zoom. So you may use that to share information or best practices or to comment on the responses to the questions. Um, also, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen to submit questions to the panelists for their responses. And we have several questions that have already been submitted and are being culled through by our staff here at the Macy Foundation. Um, the first question, from an anonymous attendee who has witnessed patients of color demanding to be treated by white staff only. Should the response framework be the same? Sachin, would you like to um, take that question? Yeah, I think the response framework um, addresses it, you know, uh, fairly well. I mean, I think it, it creates um, the the space in which the request can be discussed and processed, you know, within a within a team setting. So, um, you know, the 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 question is not, you know, whether these whether or not these things are going to actually happen. They're going to happen. They happen every single day. I think the question is is how do we create a safe environment in which um, you know people can feel seen and honored, you know, by the teams in which they work. Um, and so, I, I think. Um, you know, I think the framework does take that into account by creating the space for that, that dialogue. Pooja, do you wanna maybe add to that? Yeah, no, I just wanna echo that. I, I, I don't have anything particularly to add, but I think the, the framework is applicable to both of those scenarios. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what is the best way to educate or train students as they prepare to enter the clinical setting? Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at this one. So I think, um, you know, what is the best way to train students? I think first we have to train students in any fashion because right now, most students, most medical students at least are not receiving really any training on this issue before they enter clinical rotations. So the first step would be to, you know, highlight this issue as something that they might be confronting in their medical training and provide them with a toolkit um, so for example, you know, you could use our frameworks as a starting point, invite them to discuss, um, you know, how can they, what, what's the language that they can use when they're, they're confronted with these scenarios? Um, what are some of the key um, steps that they should be thinking about? And invite them to participate in a discussion with you because often that's how students can, uh, students will learn the best on how to dissect these pretty complex cases. and have them engage in a discussion with you about, you know, in 
in this case, how might one react? And in, in another case, how might another person react? Thank you, Pooja. I, I, would, um, I would add, you know, I would just say, I think there's a broad acknowledgement of the problem of difficult or angry patients. Um, I think that's part of, you know, kind of the, the curriculum at many medical schools. But I think the flavors of that are not necessarily often made explicit. Um, and I think, you know, this additional flavor of, of, of racist patients and, you know, orienting students to institutional response, responses and the mechanisms that they have um, is something that we have to be, you know, clearly more explicit about. Um, and I, I will add one thing to this. Um, and um, one of you actually mentioned this um, in the chat. And that is, I think, one of the most powerful ways um, to teach about this topic is not only the preparation that, that Pooja outlined, but to really address the situations as they happen in real time. And um, although it was um, a long time ago when I was a student, it was not uncommon um, for a patient to express their discomfort with seeing a student or for them to be um, bold and say that they did not want any students involved in their care. And I remember um, how I watched the attending physicians model the behavior that that was not an option, that was not acceptable, that we were a teaching institution and that uh, the students were in fact among the most important members of the healthcare team. And as I watched the attending physicians um, and the program directors, um, they really taught by example. And so I know as um, has already been mentioned that many of you are in those roles and I would just encourage you to speak up in the moment and I cannot tell you how meaningful and how powerful that is um, for your trainees who are often standing there embarrassed, ashamed, um, you know, feeling the kind of unworthiness that sticks with them forever. Um, when I have conversations with students and faculty and um, other physicians and I ask them if they ever had um, such an experience to a person, they tell me that they have and then they go on in detail to tell me what happened. And very often um, what happened went unaddressed but when it was addressed, it was so meaningful. Um, and in fact, they trained the next generation for how to manage that. So I just want to encourage you to speak up, um, whether you're the leader of a team or even a bystander, maybe you're another student on that team. And when something is not right, it's important to stand up and give voice to that to let people know that the boundary has been crossed. Thank you. Um, this next question um, asks, how do you see the relationship between a patient's expression of bias and other forms of workplace violence or bias? I almost see it as worse in, in a lot of ways, um, in the same way that I think, you know, our federal laws uh, treat hate crimes as being especially heinous. Um, I, I see this, these as being a, a separate category in many ways, um, because I think the, the depth of the assault is even, is even you know, kind of more profound. Um, that's my, my personal opinion about it. I don't know if other panelists have, have a different perspective. I, I agree with that, um, Sachin, just because um, when, when those kinds of biased um, comments are left unaddressed, I think that the, the harm over time accumulates and um, makes a very deep wound. I, I absolutely agree. I think there's something about the bias coming from those who we are trained to serve, who we are dedicated to serving, uh, that makes it just, um, you know, hurt a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how would the framework that you presented address racist behaviors by an impaired patient, 
one who lacks the capacity to take responsibility for their words and behaviors. Pooja, do you want to take that? I think the left side of the framework. Yeah, sure. Um, so absolutely, I think that's a, it's a great point. Um, and that's, it's one of the exceptions that I think we need to be very cognizant of um, is in, you know, when we're assessing a patient's decision-making capacity, uh, if we do deem that this person is, you know, cognitively impaired, mentally ill, or in some other way, not able to make decisions to the best of his or her capacity, um, then I, I think this framework, you know, needs to be adapted to, the, to that. Um, we need to be able to have some more leeway for, for those patients. Um, and, and I think I like to come back to this idea of intent. Um, you know, it, it, we're, you're always wanting to think about, you know, what is the intent of this person? Um, you know, it, are they actually intending to harm uh, the recipient in some way with, through their remarks. And often for patients with impaired decision-making capacity, that intent is uh, fairly benign. Not always, but um, fairly. Following up on the uh, question about the framework, um, another attendee has asked, um, have you put this into use? And if so, how is it going? I would say a number of institutions have put in pieces of it. I don't think there's an institution where um, it's been fully implemented. I, you know, when I was um, leading Care More Health, um, you know, we we implemented a, a no tolerance policy for outpatient visits around um, you know these types of interactions. I, I you know I will say, you know, staff in many in many cases are more resilient. Um, I think the fact that a policy existed. Um, was that that allowed them to kind of step away from so-called racist interactions, I think created a high degree of comfort around um, what they enabled themselves to be subjected to. It's something, you know, as I've transitioned to my new role at SCAN, something we're looking at, um, you know, but we haven't actually taken action yet. Um, I've only been there for, for six months. But um, what I would say is, uh, you know, I think the, even, even the presence of a policy around it uh, creates a huge lift in morale in the sense that I think people are, um, uh, you, you know, feel like it's something that's on the radar, something that, you know, will be treated seriously if it gets reported and that there are, you know, there's a clear pathway to escalation around when these episodes actually take, take place. So, um, you know, I, again, the, full, the full, full framework, you know, hasn't been implemented necessarily, but I would say that one piece was, so. So I'll just follow up on that. Um, so at Harvard Medical School, where, where I'm a medical student, um, so I presented, um, you know, a, a version of this framework to all of our preceptors of first year medical students. Um, and that was as a direct result of these preceptors, um, you know, telling our faculty, telling our leadership over and over again that they needed more training on this issue. Um, so they reported, you know, it was only a, a couple of weeks ago, but um, they reported after the session that, you know, they, they feel at least a little bit more prepared to address these situations when they do occur, especially to trainees, and especially to first year medical students who, you know, likely have not confronted this in their education just yet. So even just you know, making, put, getting all of the faculty members on one page and, and giving them a, a basic uh, stepping stone that they can use to uh, fine tune the language they use when these situations occur, um, and just have a framework in mind so that they're not completely caught off guard um, is a great starting point for those of you who are um, in leadership positions at medical schools or, or health profession schools. Thank you. Racism and bias uh, can be communicated and reinforced through nonverbal channels and even symbols. Um, how might a healthcare trainee pick up on these more subtle behaviors and messages? And what might they do about it? So I see, um, you know, I, I think that's absolutely correct is that, you know, healthcare or symbols, like for example, um, there are several papers that have been written about the impact of the swastika sign on, uh, on trainees or, or, you know, clinicians in general. Um, actually had a patient just a couple of days ago with one, with a tattoo of one. Um, and, and I would say that those kinds of symbols have a 
about the same impact as language. Even if uh, it's nonverbal versus verbal, oftentimes they carry the same amount of, um, of meaning and cause a similar amount of harm, honestly, on the recipient. So, um, you know, it, it, we should be viewing we should be viewing those situations perhaps a little bit differently, but consider the impact about the same. Thank you. Um, next question is, how does an attending um, back up a trainee who is black, indigenous, or person of color without at the same time taking away that trainee's autonomy and power? I mean, I, you know, I, I will say, um, uh, I can tell you what not to do. <laughs> um, you can, you can accommodate the patient's request, um, to, you know, kind of transfer care. You can, um, uh, not address the comments that were made and, in, in, and therefore render the trainee invisible. Um, you, uh, should not minimize what happened, uh, which is what happened, you know, to some extent in, in, my situation, um, you should, uh, you know, kind of lay out a, a solutioning process. And I, and I, I think this is really important is lay, laying out a solutioning process, meaning empowering that trainee to transfer the care of that patient to another trainee or to a, another team. Um, you should, you know, empower the person to, you know, use whatever HR, uh, kind of vehicles exist to, file an incident report. Uh, I think, you, you know, when I think back, I've now kind of been in the workplace for 10 years post training. And I, and I think back to how little I knew about how to work with HR on a, <laughs> on a, on a problem when I was actually uh, a trainee. And I think that there's actually room to grow around, around that type of thing. So I think the, the job of the attending is to make the trainee feel visible first and foremost, um, and to give significance to what happened uh, uh, you know, as opposed to minimizing it, which is oftentimes everyone's first reflex. And I'll just add that, you know, as the attending, you can play a really key role in making sure that the student or the trainee feels empowered to make the best decision for themselves, um, because every trainee will react to the, these kinds of situations um, in a oftentimes a very different way. And what one student, student A wants may not be what student B wants, um, even when confronted with the same situation. So really taking the time to check in with the student and make sure that, you know, whatever action they want to take, you're supporting them in that path. Yes, and I'd like to just underline that um, it's very important as the attending physician to um, engage in that conversation with the trainee and to err on the side of, of standing up for them and empowering them and affirming um, what they are likely um, feeling. So um, I think that so often uh, the students and the residents feel that they need to be, um, you know, above above this um, kind of uh, treatment and that that's what doctors should do. And I'm, I'm encouraging you to redouble your efforts to draw the line that it is not okay to be spoken to in um, a way that is um, demeaning and disrespectful. And this of course also extends to other members of the healthcare team. Sometimes a patient um, may be very disrespectful um, to a nurse or a physical therapist or uh, anyone else. Um, and I think it's important um, for the team leader, for the attending physician to um, draw that boundary on behalf of the entire um, healthcare team wherever the uh, patient's inappropriate behavior may be being directed. And if I may, I'm just going to um, underline just one more point is, you know, don't necessarily wait until these incidents happen to bring up the issue of patient bias and responding to it with your trainees. Oftentimes, it's very powerful when 
um, you know, at the very beginning of a clinical experience or a stage of clinical training uh, where you're working with that student or students in general, uh, that faculty across the board make it clear that, um, you know, this kind of behavior will some may happen and uh, that students should feel empowered to to speak up and and that they will support them in that. Thank you. Um, the next question is more um, about an institutional um, sort of response. What, healthcare organizations have policies for personnel behavior for their employees. At what point should we ask that they develop policies for patient behavior? I think that time is now. Um, you know, and I think most of the time we take this kind of view that, you know, Patients are innocents who, you know, whose rights we have to preserve and protect. Um, but I think this discussion demonstrates that that's not always the case and that there are responsibilities associated with being a patient as well. And one of those responsibilities is that you do not engage in abusive behavior of staff. Now, of course, if a patient is an extremist and is, you know, clinically unstable or uh, delirious uh, and, you know, the vitriol is kind of taking place in that context, I think there's, there's a particular approach to dealing with it, but I also think institutions need to adopt a, a zero tolerance policy um, to really protect the people who care for, for, for the patients. Often institutions have a clinician's bill of rights. And I think the time just echoing what Sachin said is time is ripe to have a patient's bill of rights. Uh, this next question is very practical. Um, should these racist patients' interactions be documented in the medical record? And if so, do, are there any recommendations or best practice for doing so? And should we also be concerned about biasing other providers who have access to that medical record? Your thoughts? I think if the incident happened, it gets documented. I mean, it's, I don't mean to be super glib about it, but I, I, I don't think um, there's any uh, imperative to not document, you know, when these things are happening, it's part of someone's, you know, clinical experience in a, in a particular setting. Thank you. Um, Next question is whether or not you've had advice or an experience where white clinical staff can address racial microaggressions or slurs from white patients. I haven't seen it, I haven't observed it, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, you know, I think there are other types of microaggressions that, that you know, folks experience all the time, um, but I have not seen you know, anything that I'm personally witnessed to my knowledge, anything that fits into that category. I don't know, Holly, if you have other perspectives. Um, yes, well, I have witnessed it. Um, and of course it's, um, it's managed in a case by case format, but if I think I'm seeing a microaggression, um, sometimes I'm not sure. And so then I, um, I decide that I need to gather more data points. I need to continue the conversation with the patient and um, continue observing. But, but very often it's very clear uh, with, with um, one incident that I am seeing a microaggression. Um, and when that happens, I address it with the patient um, when that's appropriate to, um, again, set the, set the guardrails, set the boundaries um, that what I believe I heard is upsetting to me and it's upsetting for the following reasons. Um, other times, um, depending upon the state that the patient is in as was described in this framework, I um, would always speak with the, um, the student or the resident about what I observed. And, um, and first of all, hear their feelings. Did they hear it the way I heard it? And sometimes I, I learned that, that others have, 
have heard or witnessed what I witnessed a little bit differently a, with a little bit of nuance. And so it's helpful to me um, to hear how the student or the resident experienced it. But, but my job is to um, provide the very best quality of care and protect the people on the team who are trying to deliver that care um, to the patient. And that includes everything from microaggressions to very um, extreme racist behavior. But the microaggressions are very important and um, worthy of calling out and worthy of having the conversation with the trainees um, about what they saw and what they heard. And over many years, I've been impressed that the trainees um, usually see a lot more than I see. They often um, are able to see things in the background um, because they were interacting with the patient a lot more um, than I was. And they are able to point out patterns um, that I otherwise would not have been aware of. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how can we address uh, the racist patient issue from a multidisciplinary perspective where nurses, physicians, students can all support one another together? Well, I, I think one, one way to begin is um, to have um, regular interdisciplinary rounds. Um, and I know that um, many many institutions and many programs do that on a, a regular basis. Um, but I think that uh, the interdisciplinary rounds where all the members of the team um, come together to talk about the patients on the service, to engage in the discharge planning and the management of um, the patients under their care. Um, this is a very, very important topic um, to cover in those rounds. So. So that's one way that I would start um, is in a multidisciplinary rounds. Such an I, I, I would also just say it's about institutional culture. Um, you know, I think you know a lot of times within healthcare organizations, you have a physician culture, you have a nursing culture, you have an administrator culture, and they all are prioritizing different things and they all care about different things. And I think there's an opportunity to create a unified set of values across each of those institutional silos um, by agreeing at a high level around, you know, DE&I being a priority, you know, zero tolerance for racist patients being a priority. Um, and then, you know, enabling, you know, the, there to be, um, you know, cross-functional support because these are cross-functional priorities. Uh, I think oftentimes we, when we have, when we deliver these kinds of messages, we think about them in the context of the medical education mission or the patient care mission or the nursing work or, um, or, you know, the, the, you know, kind of the, the, the physician milieu, I think if, you know, top leadership in an organization embraces these as a priority, then everyone has permission to engage with each other on it. Um, cause they're all singing from the song, same song sheet and an institution has declared a certain set of priorities that oftentimes just doesn't happen. And that's, I think what we're, what we're trying to have happen. I think there's also an opportunity for a, a multidisciplinary approach to the education aspect of this, um, where you know we often sometimes think about you know how can we educate medical students about this um, versus how do we educate all health profession students about this or all trainees about this across the hospital, um, and in if we create those shared education spaces, there's also the the chance for different trainees with different backgrounds to share their own experiences with each other and learn together. Um, so I think, you know, what all, what all three of us are saying is that, you know, from, from training to actual practice, uh, to actual, uh, to, to the rounds themselves, there's an opportunity to really bring all, all folks together and, and talk about these things in a very multidisciplinary way. Thank you. Uh, this next question comes from a medical student who's preparing to enter their clerkship. Um, they're going to a place where they believe it lacks culture for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and are interested in how you would suggest someone in their situation bringing up racist patient experience, having the confidence that it will be well received, though. You know, I would say as a medical student myself, um, 
have the confidence to bring it up to your, to your attending when it does occur. Um, and identify those in your medical school who can support you and who can serve as a point of contact for you um, when these incidents do occur. Um, but also just feel empowered in the moment to speak up to your attending because um, that's, be that's the best way we can, we can address these issues is by speaking up in the moment. Um, yeah, and... yeah let, me, let, me, let me give you a little bit of a different take on this. The cost to you if you don't speak up is far more profound than you'll ever recognize in the moment. Um, we, you know, we experience psychic injury in a lot of different ways. And I think one of the ways in which we ex experience psychic injury is by not speaking up. And, um, when, when there is injustice or when we are treated unjustly. And, um, I know in the near term, the considerations are around getting along and feeling like you're part of a team, but you also have to remember, you don't want to be a part of a team that endorses or embraces unjust behavior. Um, the, the long-term psychological accumulated impact of that, um, you know, and I, I can't say I've experienced it from racism, but I've experienced it working in corporate cultures that have, have in, you know, tolerated bad things or bad behaviors. The long-term injury to you of not speaking up is, is significant. And so I would just encourage you um, to, to do what Pooja said, but do so with not just not because it's a good thing to do, um, do so because the cost to you, if you don't do it, will be far more profound than anything you should, you should have to experience or, or bear the cost of. Yeah, and I'll just take it one step further, since um, it sounds like you are a student about to enter um, clinical clerkships, um, and you're anticipating some of the things that um, you might encounter, which is um, a very healthy thing to, to do, you might consider um, finding some allies, um, finding some more experienced students, perhaps a year or two ahead of, of yourself. And um, maybe you put together a panel discussion at your medical school about how best to prepare um, for complex situations with um, difficult patient situations at a particular setting where you might find yourself. So um, I, I'm um, affirming the fact that you are correct to be raising the question. I think you heard from um, Dr. Jane and uh, Dr. Chandra Shaker to um, think about how to speak up in the moment, but maybe even take it a step further and um, prepare with you and your colleagues um, before you get um, into the situation. Thank you. The next question is whether some of the episodes or incidents that you've been talking about offer opportunities to educate the racist patient, hopefully to re for them to recognize and even to ameliorate their antisocial behavior. So, so, so I, I really reject the, like my job is to educate the patient uh, framework. Because what, what I will say is, um, it's almost kind of like blaming the victim or creating an added burden on the victim. Um, maybe someone else on the team can, can do that, but I think the person who's experienced it is often ill-equipped to do that. And, um, you know, I, I will say, uh, you know, it is, it is very arrogant of a physician or a trainee to think that they can undo 50 years of bad parenting and, <laughs> and bad perspective on the world and people um, with a single conversation. Um, so, I, you know, I, my, my personal perspective is that whoever is a victim of, of this is, should not be asked to be in a position. I can, and I say this from experience because that was a, a lot of the response I got from, uh, from the cheap seats about, you know, my experience with the patient. Um, you know, essentially, uh, you know, you should be better than that. And your job is to show the patient and teach the patient that they shouldn't be racist and that you are a qualified Indian American um, you know, who went to Harvard three times that, that, that was, that was a, <laughs> it was a completely preposterous notion. And I, I just, you know, I, I don't mean to jump on whoever asked the question, but I, I really feel that the idea that you should kind of place the victim in the role, the abuse victim, which is what it is in the role of rehabilitating the abuser is, is really kind of a, a framework that, um, I find unpalatable. 
Yeah, I, I just want to support um, Suchin in that uh, statement, um, really for not only the reasons that he articulated, but I think we all know that um, it's highly unlikely that a single conversation will change um, a worldview or perspective um, that, that is likely very deeply ingrained. However, I think what is possible is to set a very clear boundary, a very clear limit that what you just heard um, or what you just said um, is completely unacceptable. Now, I wanna focus on your blood pressure or I wanna focus on you know, the reason that you're here today. Um, but I am, I am pleased to be able to do that, but I will not allow you to speak to the nurse that way or to speak to my student that way or to speak to me that way. Um, and so I think setting a clear boundary and redirecting to focus on the issue at hand is the way I would handle it. I would also document it as we mentioned um, earlier. Um, but I would not spend the very valuable time trying to change um, very deeply ingrained behaviors. Now, would I love for that person to be able to change um, that attitude? Absolutely. I just don't believe that that's the role, um, as, as Sachin just said, of the um, abuser, of the person being abused to um, take that role on. Thank you. Uh, we are approaching the hour um, and we have time for one more question. Um, and that is, is there ever a time that it is appropriate to refuse future treatment as a result of racial abuse from a patient? I, I think absolutely, as long as you can safely transfer the care of a patient. You know, there's, there's all these kind of scenarios and situations if you're in a small town and you're the only cardiologist or, you know, that, that I think test this idea. But I think, you know, um, there's no reason to kind of continue to, you know, in a non-emergent situation, require yourself to be the victim of, of someone's abuse. Um, I think that is, a, that is exactly the attitude that we're trying to change in the profession, which is this notion that, you know, the patient is always right. You know, our job is to always serve no matter what. Um, I think there are limits to service. I think it's an unpopular view that there are limits to service. Um, but I believe, you know, if, if you can safely transfer the care of the patient to someone else, there are absolutely limits. And um, we have to preserve ourselves for the long haul. And I think our profession has done a bad job of necessary, of, of putting ourselves in a position to preserve our psyches, preserve our mental health, preserve our dignity, frankly, in the face of um, these types of attacks. And um, if part of preserving that dignity is transferring the care of the patient to someone else, then that is what we must do. Thank you, Sachin. I think that was um, a, a superb response, which I also agree with very strongly. Um, I'd like to thank all of uh, the participants. Um, you have been a, a wonderful um, virtual audience for us today. And I, I want to acknowledge that um, there are hundreds of questions, or at least it looks that way to me, um, in the um, question and answer um, part of today's webinar that we have not been able to get to. But I'd like to um, announce that we are going to follow up this webinar um, with a podcast um, and we will use um, many of the questions that you submitted today um, as part of that podcast. So um, stay tuned. You will hear more from the Macy Foundation um, about the follow-up podcast on this very important topic. The other thing I'd like to just underline is that um, the vast majority of patients and families who we interact with um, uh, behave in, in such appropriate ways. Um, they bring real meaning to our work. Um, they're the reason that um, we took on this work to begin with. But we cannot be our best um, as healthcare professionals if we don't have the tools to deal with the less common but but very important and very destructive and damaging situations that can come up um, 
as we've been discussing over the last hour. And you just saw on the slide uh, that was presented that we do have um, upcoming webinars um, and you will hear more about those upcoming webinars. But the next one on March 11th is going to focus on um, bias and discrimination as it impacts um, LGBTQ um, providers and patients. Thank you very much um, for attending and um, we'll look forward to further interactions. And I'd like to thank um, my co-hosts um, for today's uh, webinar um, and you will hear more from them in our follow-up podcast.